Hey everyone, welcome to session 201 of the Behavioral Observations Podcast. Let's start the show out with a question. Would you rather earn preferred items or simply get them for free? Well, it turns out there's been some basic and applied research in this area, and there are some studies that actually demonstrate participants' general preference for earning reinforcers as opposed to simply getting them for doing nothing or getting them response independently, perhaps more technically stated. So my guest for this episode, Dr. Holly Gover, published a review and meta-analysis on this topic in a recent issue of Java called On the Generality of Preference for Contingent Reinforcement. In this episode, we discuss how she became interested in this topic, what motivated her to review this literature, what she learned from this process, and perhaps of most interest to listeners, what are the findings, what are the clinical implications that these findings have for practice? And towards the end of the conversation, we changed gears a bit and talked about her work in the area of feeding challenges. We did a quick review of what we know about feeding challenges from the lens of behavior analytic assessment and treatment. And she discussed her unique approach to solving some of these problems. And if you are uh, interested in learning more, she'll be presenting on this topic at the upcoming Stone Soup Conference on October 21st. And the Stone Soup Conference, as you've heard me talk about before, is a great event. Uh, and I have a link to sign up for it in the show notes for this episode. And if you decide to sign up for it, you can use the promo code PODCAST to save at registration. It's a really great deal with great speakers for a great cause. And I'd be remiss if I didn't ask or more, I guess, pointedly beg you to listen to her advice for the newly minted BCBA. I know I say this a lot in these introductory comments, but I'm not kidding you. This has to be the best piece of advice that I've heard in a long time. In fact, I'm, I'm hard-pressed to think of better advice that have, that's been given on this podcast, and it's perfect for today's behavior analytic environment. So I really, really want... If you don't listen to anything else, fast forward all the way to the end of this podcast and just listen to that segment. But I think you'll be well served listening to the entire episode, and I hope you enjoy this conversation as much as I did. In addition to the Stone Soup Conference, if you are interested in a deeper dive into feeding challenges, my colleague Jen Ferris is putting together a 10-week intensive mentoring cohort on this topic called Happy, Relax, and Eating. This is a 10-week cohort consisting of six two-hour live virtual meetings, and it includes 12 continuing education units. There is also an option for the same thing with no CEs at a discounted rate, and Jen is giving podcast listeners a 10% discount when you use the code BOP at checkout, or you can just tell Jen you heard it on this podcast. Uh, beyond the realm of feeding, if you're looking for continuing ed on a wider variety of topics, don't forget that many of your favorite behavioral observation shows are appro- available for approved continuing ed as well. Just go to behavioralobservations.com and click on the CEU tab to learn more. All right. I think that's it for opening remarks. So without any further delay, let's dive right into this fascinating interview with Dr. Holly Gover. Welcome to the Behavioral Observations Podcast, stimulating talk for today's behavior analysts. Now, here's your host, Matt Sicoria. Dr. Holly Gober, thanks for joining me on the Behavioral Observations Podcast today. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. I'm so excited to be here. Longtime listener, first time uh, guest. <laughs> I see. I see. Okay. Uh, very cool. I'm excited to have this conversation as well. We've certainly been talking about it for a little bit, so it's fun to actually make it happen. Um, we, we've got a, quite a bit of things to, uh, to cover today. Uh, we've got kind of, I guess, an ambitious agenda. Um, and so one of the things I, I really want to dig into the paper you talked about uh, that came out, um, we can get into what specific issue of job I came out in, but the idea of, uh, of the, pr- uh, the general preference for contingent reinforcement, uh, you know, just from a conceptual standpoint, it's really fascinated me. Uh, and, and its premise seems somewhat counterintuitive. So I really want to get into that. Uh, I really want to talk about your interest in feeding as well. And of course, uh, in due 
course, I guess, uh, talk about the upcoming presentation you're doing on that topic at the Stone Soup Conference. But before we get into that, let's start like we always do here at Behavioral Observations. Tell me a little bit about how you first encountered behavior analysis, uh, what what made you, what, what drew you to it, and what, what made you want to pursue it as a career? Sure. So um, I actually uh, came to discover behavior analysis in a kind of roundabout way, as, as many folks have. Um, I studied art history and French in my undergraduate degree um, in New York City. Uh, but then my friend and I, on a whim, decided to move to Tennessee. And, um, uh, you know, maybe not unsurprisingly, there weren't a lot of like uh, art historical jobs out in the rural South. And so I needed a job. I was looking for jobs all over. And I ended up getting a job in a life skills special ed classroom in a school district in uh, Tennessee, outside of Nashville. And um, day one, I just absolutely adored it um, because I just loved the, the students so much. They were a joy to work with. They were so funny and just enjoyable to hang out with. Um, and so that just immediately took me on a different path. And I thought about looking into being a special education teacher or, you know, so, something to that effect. But um, one of the students had a behavior analyst who would come in occasionally, help out in um, with his programming in the classroom. And then there was also um, a direct care staff who came in pretty frequently, too, and worked with him. And everything that they seemed to do to me just seemed like magic. Um, I was just like, how do you get him to cooperate? Like, I can't get any of this out of him. Like, what's going on? Like, who are who are you people? Um and it turns out it wasn't magic. In fact, it was um, science and uh, it was incredibly exciting to learn about it. So I would always kind of um, ask them, you know, on the side, like, well, so what it is this you do? How'd you get here? What's your job? And ended up going and working for that company doing in-home behavior analysis services um, on uh, a military base outside of Nashville. And so my love for it just continued to grow. And I took um, some coursework to get my BC ABA at the time, and then um, and then realized I wanted to keep going with my education. And so I moved back to my home state of California, and went and got my master's degree at Cal State Northridge. And um, it was there that I had the absolute uh, honor and privilege to work with Dr. Tara Faney, and. Um, and I joined her research lab during my, my master's graduate degree. And so I, I really didn't have research on my radar prior to that. Um, and so my first introduction to research was, was through um, Dr. Faini. And exactly like before, it was like a pivot where I was kind of taken on a, a new trajectory. And I, I just really loved conducting applied research in applied settings. We were in a, a, um, a preschool classroom. And um, Dr. Femi also then introduced me to Greg Hanley's work, and I became really invested in his work um, and then was able to see him as, as a kind of like a young BCABA, saw him present at Calaba and then was just like, I would like to go work for that person. I'm going to do everything I can to apply for his uh, doctoral program. Um, and so then I applied for that program and then, then uh, was able to complete my, my doctoral degree with Greg Hanley um, in Massachusetts. So that's the kind of roundabout way I got there. I'm so grateful for it. Um, and I now actually, it's kind of funny coming full circle. Um, I actually just moved back to Tennessee um, 12 years later. Um, my partner and I, Dr. Uh, Adithian Rajaraman, previous pod guest. Um, pod fave. Pod fave. And we just moved uh, down to Nashville and um, took uh, accepted faculty positions at um, in the Department of Pediatrics at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where we work with a fantastic group called Triad, um, a fantastic group of practitioners and researchers. So we have joined that team down here in Nashville. So my, my behavior analytic career uh, began in Nashville, uh, outside of Nashville in, in Tennessee. And 12 years later, I find myself back here. Um, so it's pretty, pretty cool. That's uh that's, that's a great story. You know, my, uh, my daughter 
is in the twelfth grade right now. We're looking at mm-hmm. colleges and things like that. And of course, I've I haven't pushed it too hard, but I've said to my kids, I'm like, look, there is a kind of a career in what I do, and there's no shortage of jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And they're not interested. She's more along the uh-huh. lines of a liberal arts, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, classical, you know, yes. humanities, uh, yep. and very much interested in French and uh, and uh, yep. art yep. and things like that. So it made me think of that. So there's 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 hope for her, even if she does. Absolutely, go down she that may road. find her way back to the science. I mean, if you had told me, and as a, a young person, that I would eventually be a scientist, I mean, that I, that would be so surprising to a very young Holly. So yeah, you never, you never know where life might take you. I know this is completely random, but do do, do you, do you have, you know, is your, is your French fluent and do you have a chance to practice it or, or, you know, I know. I've lost quite a bit of it. I I spent a, a good chunk of time over in France. Um, where I was like almost fluent when I left, but it's now been 10 years. I still do the Duolingo and I try and listen to music and watch shows and whatnot because I have a dream of eventually um, being able to partner with some folks over there and, you know, getting to do some behavior analysis in France or Belgium or other French speaking places. So I'm trying to keep it sharp because if that opportunity ever arises, uh, I'm here. So if you're listening, if you're out there, if you're in France, (laughs) hit me up. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I know, you know, there's, there's a, uh, the, the, there's definitely some listeners in, uh, in the uh, province of Quebec as well mm-hmm, that, mm-hmm. Uh, that uh, have, have chimed in from time to time. So I think there's a, uh, they call it QABA, if I'm not mistaken. Oh, yes. Um, so, right. I got so yeah, there. yeah. So I'm, uh, we, we, we can dream, right. You know, I, yes, I, exactly. I've, uh, I think when we first met at, uh, at the FTF offices a few years mm-hmm. ago, the, um, I, I have uh, been uh, uh, I've been over to France a couple of times uh, and just uh, really lamented not learning a second language as, as thoroughly really? as I would like to. I, I did some crash course stuff just so I could like, you know, uh, make your way around. Ask yeah, the bathroom. yeah. Ask where the bathroom is. Yeah, that was really my priority <laughs> that that, you know, uh, ordering coffee. So anyway, um, that uh, th- that notwithstanding, um, I. So you're back in you're back in Nashville. Um, you're you're at Vanderbilt, which it sounds amazing. So congratulations on, as you say, coming full circle in that journey. It sounds like a, like a fun ride, kind of a whirlwind tour, I guess, of uh, of various corners of the country. Um, so let, let's talk about the, uh, the this big paper that that you published in uh, Java. Uh, earlier this year and it's um, on, on the uh, I th- believe it's called on the preference for contingent reinforcement and there's uh, as all these papers are I think there's a subtitle to it that goes on uh, mm-hmm. and you could certainly fill in the blanks but um, I'm always curious you know you know publishing a paper especially a conceptual paper is so much work um, well actually this is more of a meta-analysis if I'm not mistaken right so it's it but, but so I'm always curious what what is the motivation to 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 take on what seemed to me like a massive undertaking like this. So we'll get into the the the, the nuts and bolts of sure. what it is you discovered. But what, from a motivation standpoint, what what were you seeing in the in in the in the yeah. practice in the, in the science that that wasn't being addressed that you felt that you had to undergo this this intense scholarship to uncover. Certainly. So at the at the time when um, we were forming this paper, so so I wrote this paper as part of my doctoral degree. We were as part of the program. You write a um, an empirical uh, paper, and then you're also called upon to write a literature review um, of your own choosing. And so at the time, our research and practice group was just beginning to evaluate some procedures in which kids had the choice to participate in the treatment or not. Um, And so this is when we were, we were um, having some of our first clients that were going through the early versions of the enhanced choice model um, in which they can go into a room and access all of their reinforcers for free, or they could come into a different room and participate in a skills-based treatment. And 
receive access to reinforcers contingent on cooperating and communication and toleration skills. Um, so we were just beginning to explore some of these ideas and, and we were also doing the same in our feeding research. Um, we were allowing kids to opt out of the treatment and the treatment was only in place when they were voluntarily opting back into the treatment. And, and so we were kind of indirectly addressing this phenomenon of maybe there being a preference for contingent versus non-contingent reinforcement. It certainly wasn't the, the main point of, of those studies. We weren't looking at preference for those things. It was just a procedural component of the, of the process. Um, and so it felt really timely just to look in, into some of the literature, looking at preference for contingent versus non-contingent reinforcement. Um, and then, of course, Greg himself has studied the topic with him and Kevin Lazinski um, in 2009, published a paper called Do Children Prefer Contingent Reinforcement? And they did some pretty neat follow up studies as well. Um, so it was one, a, a topic that Greg was pretty familiar with, too. Um, it there has yet to be a literature review conducted on the topic. Three, we were beginning to talk about some of these, you know, potential processes in our um, in our practice with our research and practice group. Um, and then, you know, not unrelatedly, it was also a really it was kind of a, a tidy project um, in that there are not five million papers out there looking at contingent versus non-contingent reinforcement. So as, as a contrast, I think uh, Dr. Mashi Gayamagami, her lit review for her doctoral degree had like over 200 articles in it because she was looking broadly at functional communication oh, with yeah. over like 600 applications. I mean, just like a beast of a paper. And I wasn't trying to write that lit review. So this one was also, Smart. in addition to all those other things, nice and tidy, 15 papers. So st still a heavy lift, you know, conceptually and, and putting it all together. But um, uh, yeah, a little more manageable, I would think. <laughs> I see. So you know, right out of the gate uh, in the paper, you, you, you uh, I guess, acquaint the reader with a couple of theories, the theory of least effort and the concept of contra-free loading. Um, I, so given that you started the paper with those sorts of things, can you maybe start us the discussion off with giving us a quick rundown of what, what those mean? Sure, absolutely. Um, so generally, the theory of least effort is that animals uh, will behave in a way that maximizes reinforcement while minimizing effort, which um, on face value, you know, like simply like on paper, like that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, but then there's also this concept of contra free loading. So that, that's the word that the um, that the basic scientists use to describe this phenomenon before um, folks started studying it with um uh, humans. And so contrafy loading is said to occur when an animal is taught an operant response um, to obtain a reinforcer, often food, um, but then uh, freely available food is placed in their operant chamber and they continue to receive a majority of their food um, um, through, through a lever press, through an operant response. And so if the animal obtains more than 50% of their food via the lever press versus the free food, then um, they're considered to have a preference for contingent reinforcement. And so it has been uh, replicated across numerous species, um, replicated across rats and pigeons and monkeys and chickens and um, Japanese fighting fish um, will be behave or will it will emit an operant response to um, gain access to a mirror. Apparently, they like looking at themselves in a in the fish tank. Um, and so it's been replicated across a whole host, a whole host of species. So it seems like there's a lot of generality to it. Um, and then just as a very small digression, Matt, can you guess the one animal in which they were unable to show this phenomenon with? Uh, no, I, I, uh, I, oh, I would, I don't know, maybe what dogs, maybe I was thinking like, <laughs> I, I don't know, humans. It was actually the domestic cat. <laughs> okay. The domestic cat preferred to continue to receive their food for free versus, you know, quote unquote, working for it. it we could call There's that the, even, the Garfield effect, right? Or something exactly, like. exactly. There's even this like paper out there. I forget the entire title. It's called like um, 
feline, like the feline indolence, which I think means is a fancy word for laziness. And it was like, wow, we did not discover this contra freeloading phenomenon with the, the lazy house cat. Um, Anywho, that's it's all to say that there, there seems to be a lot of generality to it, but also the basic research also teaches us that there are many, many shades of nuance to the phenomenon. Um, when you look at different variables compared, like what which reinforcers are you using? What kind of experience are they getting with the preference testing? Um, um, and so if you kind of move things in one way or another, then preference can shift over to accessing the free food versus quote unquote working for it. Um, so there's a lot of nuance to it, but in general, across many preparations, especially with animals and in the basic labs, there appears to be a, uh, you know, preference for behaving for reinforcers versus not. Holly, has, have there been any uh, human operant analogs to this that have been demonstrated? Yes, there certainly have. So, um, well, not in the exact same way. So just because it's kind of, you know, folks for, you know, animals versus humans, the, the exper experimental preparations are a little different. But a lot of the early studies on the jump from contra free loading to uh, with animals, with non-human animals to uh, humans is... Um, they did try and replicate it as, as best as they could. So there's these three early articles. It's like sing, sing and queries and tart in, in the early um, late seventies, early eighties in which um, they had um, children lever pressing for marbles and like nickels and candy and things. And so if the children sat on one side of this like operandum, they could lever press for marbles and treats and whatnot. And if they sat on the other side of this operandum, they could just sit there and they would just receive those things for free on a, on a schedule that was typically yoked to the schedule that they were um, behaving on in the other context. Um, and so under it was those early studies that showed us that there might be some generality of this phenomenon to humans. Um, and, you know, with all of the data aggregated, they found that a majority of the children across various age groups um, preferred to receive their treats um, through an operant response versus waiting for it. So it was really those early studies that began the lit review because then thereafter we looked into the, all the other, all of the other studies evaluating this phenomenon with, with humans. I see. That's right. It's, now that's coming back to me. Yeah. You did describe that in the paper. And I should also note that for those who are listening along, uh, I will link to the paper in the show notes and the, uh, the as we talked about the scholarship involved in this, there's a lengthy list of references that a lot of these studies uh, uh, can be can be found. So um, that's uh, that's 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 really really interesting. So I, I'm, um, and I, I also know that in the paper you did a little bit of a you had a little bit of discussion of, of, of a lot of kind of basic, um, I guess, uh, EAB type of, you, know, you went deep into the EAB literature, I think, to, mm -hmm. to look at this, obviously, because a lot of the, uh, the, the um, experimental work is, is, are done in, um, you know, those types of, of settings. Uh, did, can, can you talk a little bit about, you know, it, you came into behavior analysis from, such an you know the, the the such the applied end of it i suppose uh what was it like to kind of delve into the you know the 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 uh the, the green journal if you will <laughs> of uh, of jab and uh other similar ones and looking into these things and you know because you know just reading the paper i i, I got a lot of memory. I, I wish I had, uh, I wish I had my old copy of Honig and Staden because <laughs> from grad school, because there was like a, a lot of terminology that I, that I'm not quite uh, fresh on, you know, so there's a lot of discussion of like, uh, you know, con, you know, terminal links and this and that mm -hmm. and whatnot. Mm -hmm. so, so talk to me a little bit about going into that literature. Certainly. Yeah. I mean, I think even when starting it, I didn't know that I would be diving that deep into a lot of the basic literature. And in, indeed, I think I also needed to have um, some of my EAB content near me at the time to fully go through these studies, which in, in which the preparations and the way that they discuss the, the preparations and results are just so different from applied work. Um, but it, it was really necessary to go to the basic literature because no lit review has been conducted on this um, phenomenon with humans. Um, and, and really, so we found 15 papers, which is really not that many if we're talking about, 
if we're attempting to talk about the generality of a phenomenon. And so, but the basic literature has, I mean, there's hundreds and hundreds of studies on this phenomenon of contra freeloading. Um, and also specifically, there is an article by Osborne, in, I think it was published in 1977, in which he reviews the basic literature on contra freeloading. So he does a lovely job. If you want to like dip your toe into the basic literature on this topic, um, I would read that review because it really nicely sums up um, the general uh, preference for, for contingent reinforcement, but then it also begins to show you the boundary conditions of this generality and like where it, it shifts back over to preference for free food when, you know, X, Y, and Z are changed as variables. So it was really necessary to kind of dig into that to help frame our understanding of this phenomenon with humans. Um, because when conducting a, a literature review, you know, you have a, a topic idea and you gather all these articles um, and it's really up to you to make sense of them and to pull out themes from them. And sometimes you get a bunch of articles together and you're like, whoo, there's not a lot here. Um, sometimes we have an idea for something and there's only two articles on it. And uh, Greg always taught us, if you're doing a lit review and there's less than five papers, then go out and do the study. Don't mm. summarize the very little data that there is here. So, um yeah, it, it's all to say that that um, learning from what they learned from the basic research was really important to help inform some of the variables that we were looking at um, when looking at all the articles with, with that were conducted with humans. I see. And that kind of leads me to another question here is that uh, can you talk a little bit more about, you know, so it just seemed like a, a massive undertaking for, you know, searching and filtering and analyzing all these papers. And, and you describe some of the processes of conducting a meta analysis. Um, and, and again, I, I promise the listener will get to some, you know, actionable applied stuff uh, and, and get out of the research weeds here in, in a minute. But I, I'm fascinated by this stuff. Just, I don't know, uh, perhaps because of my own learning history, but can you, can you walk us through just some of the, you know, how do you, how do you approach an undertaking like this as it relates to, you know, uh, throwing out these massive search nets, if you will, into the, into these databases. Uh, and, you know, uh, and again, fortunately your, uh, you know, your search results were a lot more uh, constrained, I suppose, to this, to, uh, in comparison to perhaps others. But um, so if someone were thinking about, you know, ha ha doing a meta analysis, what, what are some of the ways in which you, you know, find these relevant articles to review and how do you sort them out and things like that? Yeah, so. I think for me, our starting point was um, the papers that Greg and, and Kevin Lazinski conducted in, in 2009 and 2010, in which in the title of the paper, it is, Do Children Prefer Contingent Reinforcement? So they were very head on addressing that question of, of contra free loading with, with, with humans, um, specifically young children. And um so that was kind of my, my my starting point in that if you're interested in something and there is at least one paper on it, um, all of these search engines, including Google Scholar, have a great feature in which you can look at um, a list of all the articles that cited that paper. And that's how I really started to, to gather some of the, the initial uh, papers to even see how how often this question has been asked to even figure out if there is enough content for a literature review here. Um, so looking at every single paper that cited that, reading all of those titles, abstracts to see if they were also citing that paper because they did something similar. Um, and then what, what was particularly um, challenging about this topic and selecting the articles for inclusion are that a majority of the papers I think like a, a, you know, yeah, a majority were not specifically asking the question of do people prefer contingent versus non-contingent reinforcement, but they kind of inadvertently did by um, attempting to f answer some other clinical question. So they were maybe trying to answer the clinical question of 
hey, this DRA worked and also NCR works to treat um, challenging behavior. And then let's also ask the client which one they prefer. So they weren't specifically looking at, oh, do humans contra freeload just like the basic do? Um, but they inadvertently were answering the question for those specific participants. And so that made the search a little more difficult because um, some of the, the keywords of, you know, preference or whatnot, or, you know, contra freeloading, et cetera, were, did not um, completely apply to all of the articles. So I had to really get into the weeds of the articles and read what their preparation were and how they measured preference and um, to uh, decide if they met the inclusion criteria. So it was quite a lot of, a, a lot of reading, quite a lot of reading um, and the whittling down of, of all that uh, literature into the 15 articles that we did find. Yeah. So it sounds like a lot of these, these, uh, these things were hidden in the, in, in the, yes. in the journal mm-hmm. that you had to kind of uh, unearth through a lot of work. And that just, you know, and again, what, what came to me over and over again, I was reading the papers, like, my goodness, this is just a lot of work. So uh, kudos to you and, and your co-authors for, again, just taking this on. It's a, uh, um, so I, I want to get to the, I guess, some conclusions of, of this. Before we do that, though, one of the things that just occurred to me, I suppose, as we we're kind of walking through you know, some of the research that's been done both in the basic and, and, and uh, human operant uh, lab or, you know, basic and applied and both across species, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what, what, what research still needs to be done? You know, I, I have to imagine the researcher inside of you as you were going through this stuff was like, all right, I've gone through all these papers and, you know, this person, you know, this could have done this and this could have done that. You know, the standard stuff you see in discussion sections of articles of like, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the so-called shortcomings or directions for future research. Uh, what, you know, if, if, if resources and time were not a, an issue, uh, how, how would you go about designing a, a, another study? Or, or, or do you think the, the, uh, the results kind of stand where they are? In other words, do we know, do we know enough about this to move forward? to program a, appropriate treatment practices uh, or, or other, other research questions that are still outstanding? And, and if that's the case, how would you approach them? Yeah, that's a super question. Um, so what, what's really neat about the studies that we included in this review is that we did not have any criteria based off of the uh, uh, on like the scientific rigor of the paper um, or, you know, it, you know, threats to internal validity or, you know, did they reverse? Did they show functional control? We really, the, the, the criteria for inclusion was, did they, did the participant experience contingent reinforcement and non-contingent reinforcement? And then did they have a choice between those two things? Um, so as you can imagine, the 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 types of studies that are in this are quite varied, as are the reinforcers they evaluated, as are the participant demographics, as are the the experimental preparations, the ways in which they exposed participants to those two contexts, and the ways in which they measured preference varied across almost every single study. So that does make it challenging to make sweeping generalizations about um about certain things. And so um, what we also did in the study was we kind of whittled down the papers that did meet all the marks for having really strong internal validity, for having um, really robust scientific rigor in their preparation, meaning they controlled for many confounds. Um, And and so I really think that future research needs um, more studies of that caliber. And we kind of discuss what those features are in the discussion. We list, you know, what what is required in order to have um, a robust scientific rigor for these types of studies, specifically studying preference. So you can really get at the question of, of of measuring preference for the contingency versus accidentally measuring preference for something else, um, a confound. And so um, I think there certainly needs to be a lot more research in this um, in this realm. And what's also really exciting is there there might be some idiosyncratic preferences for contingent reinforcement. 
Um, there might be differences across reinforcers. So whether you're looking at, you know, attention, uh, do people prefer that contingently or non-contingently versus food versus um, a, an, an activity, uh, watching TV or something. So um, I think there's still a lot of nuance in this topic and just so much, so much room for, for future research. Got it. Got it. All right. So having having kind of laid the groundwork for uh, what you did, uh, how you examine these articles and things like that, what is what is the main finding that you're that you have some confidence in reporting on? What is the message, I suppose, to both the uh, I guess the people just generally interested in this topic and to the extent to which there are practice implications that mm -hmm. too. Yes. So in general, across the um, multiple preparations, across multiple participant demographics and reinforcements, it does appear that, that humans prefer contingent reinforcement relative to non-contingent reinforcement. And so that's all to say, like, like my previous answer, it, it's still incredibly nuanced and there, and there might be a lot of, um, differences uh, within those different categories of, across different people. But um, but in general, it seems like there is a, a general preference for contingent reinforcement versus non-contingent. And um, it's this is also the case, however, when um, the response effort is relatively low. So in all of these studies, it was a... Um, the, the contingent in the contingent condition, it, it, it primarily was kind of like an FR1, like I'm going to behave and receive a reinforcer versus receiving it on a yoked time-based schedule. Um, so there's a lot of future research that also needs to be done on when you, um, when you stretch out that response requirement. So for example, Kevin Lenzinski and Greg Hanley did some follow-up studies to their, their paper, um, Do Children Prefer Contingent Reinforcement, and started to look at the generality of it and kind of where the boundary conditions lay with respect to it in that they uh, progressed the ratio for contingent reinforcement um, and still compared it to receiving it non-contingently. And the participants switched over to a preference for non-contingent reinforcement at different times. Um, so one participant switched over to, to a preference for non-contingent reinforcement after an FR8. After that response requirement, they had to engage in eight responses to receive the reinforcer. And, the, and another one um, uh, transferred over after an FR10, I think. And so th those aren't too dissimilar, but um, it's still just like a little, a little flare of there might be some idiosyncratic influences to our preferences for contingent reinforcement. Um, and so that, that's also a really uh, another exciting line of research. But um, in general, people seem to prefer contingent reinforcement. And um, I'll say one more thing, another um, talking about the scientific rigor of the studies, we also um, categorized the, the studies based on their um, the strength of their scientific rigor and those studies that had more that 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 controlled um, that controlled for confounds and had increased internal validity there was actually a stronger preference for contingent reinforcement in those studies um, so if the study is very well done controlling for all confounds it, it it seems like a preference for contingent reinforcement is even more apparent. Um, so that's just even a little bit of correlational um, data that continues to support this finding that that people um, might prefer contingent reinforcement. What about the is is it worth you know I, I guess is is the, is the concept of kind of a closed versus open economy appropriate to this discussion? You know, if you're looking at say like a, going back to the animal literature, you know, a lot of these EAB preparations or you know the the subjects are kept at, you know, what, 80% uh, of their free feeding weight, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's, there's, you know, they're, they're in an opera and chamber where the only thing going on is that lever, uh, et, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so as we're talking about boundary conditions, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, and I'm, what I'm 
in my head, I'm trying to translate this to a classroom setting, you know, on it. <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like where yeah, there's, same. there are many, many reinforcers available of many different kinds. Uh, and uh, I'm sure as you and your colleagues would assert there, a lot of these reinforcers are, are, are quite synthesized uh, mm-hmm. in their, in their, uh, um, in their structure uh, or in their function and perhaps as it relates to the learner. Um and uh, and there's less control over what the individual has available to, uh, to them, and and so those that really tight internal validity that you were just describing may perhaps limit the external validity. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I, I should actually phrase this as a question: Do you think that it limits the external validity? I suppose uh, of of these types of. Uh, findings, if you will, uh, given that there, there is, um, a lot more, there are a lot more operants available, I suppose, Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot, there are a lot more stimuli in the environment. I perhaps even more broadly stated and, Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, what we might consider, you know, real world or applied settings. Yeah. Um, really super question. And, and you, you're getting at something that, um, I think for me was a a really important finding of the literature review in that a preference for contingent reinforcement is not an an internal trait uh, of of humans or, or, you know, non-human animals, but rather it really is a function of, of the environment and the experimental preparation. And so you're so right that in, in certainly the basic literature and in many of these studies that we reviewed in this paper, it is a really specific experimental preparation that they are looking at that does not always match what is actually going on in the, the natural environment. Um, I think in the natural environment and in applied settings, there are situations in which kids are, you know, getting things for free versus having to, you know, work for things. And so those still exist. But I think another great avenue for future research is looking at, um, you know, preferences for therapeutic contexts and in these applied settings like a classroom or what what have you. And also looking at, you know, synthesized reinforcers, because when you're using a synthesized reinforcement contingency, you're able to have a lot of flexibility with respect to which reinforcers you're allowing access to or not. Um, and, and, and we, based on some of our clinical work, we still think there is a lot of generality of this phenomenon to um, children in classroom settings. Um, you know, the enhanced choice model, for example, there was two participants in that paper um, in which the um, enhanced choice model, their, their treatment for their challenging behavior was conducted in their classrooms in which they always had a space that they could go to in the classroom, access synthesized reinforcement for free or come on over and, and work with a, a teacher at, at, a, at you know, their, their desk or what have you for, for those same reinforcers. So, um, you know, that's all kind of anec- anecdotal. Uh, evidence because it wasn't, it's not um, specifically studying preference and there aren't the proper controls to specifically study preference in those situations. Um, So um, yes, it's all to say that there, um, that the preparation has a lot to do with preference, the environment, the way that the experimenters set up the situations. And so there's also still a ton of research to be done to kind of take this question into the, the real world. Got it. Got it. And you do make that point in the article about the uh, uh, that the preference for contingent reinforcement has more to say about the learners uh, or the, the participants learning history. Um, uh, and so um, that, that's a point well taken. Uh, what. Uh, so. Are there are there general. Are there general suggestions or things, you know, I, I, what, what I like to do sometimes when I'm asking questions is I, I, I like to pretend that I'm in my car on the way to a school <laughs> or a clinic or whatever. And uh, I, I have you on the phone, right? And <laughs> I'm about to go do a functional analysis or I'm about to go da, 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 you know? So, so given what you learned through uh, about this, what, what uh, uh, is, is there, 
Uh, do, do you have more to say as it relates to some of the you know kind of practice implications uh, in terms of maybe uh, selecting or delivering reinforcers when we're working with individuals um, that 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 you've learned through this process or or learned through some of the er- reading the earlier work in this uh, in, in this area? Yeah, certainly. So um, there's another great uh, paper. Uh, by this guy, B.F. Skinner. Um, and it is... Uh, I'm sorry, did type- you spell that? I'm sorry, I didn't. I'm just kidding. B.F. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it is Compassion and Ethics in the Care of Vulnerable Populations. The title is actually much more outdated than that. It has the R word in the title, but it's a fantastic paper. It was written, you know, like in the 60s or so, but it's a paper, I'm pretty sure it's in the, the collection of essays and cumulative record, um, but the paper is still widely available. Um, but but in that paper, he actually kind of indirectly and inadvertently is talking about contingent versus non-contingent reinforcement. And he actually connects it to the idea of compassion and the idea of care, which is, um, you know, a pretty hot topic now as our yeah. field is kind of going through this shift towards more compassionate care. And he talks about um the the concept of caring and what we consider to be caring behavior as people who care for vulnerable populations. And that often we think about caring as the provision of, of reinforcers. Um, you know, they're hungry, feed them, they're tired, let them sleep, they're cold, you know, um, give them a blanket. Um, but that in many um, settings, it kind of goes to the extreme in which we do everything for people or, you know, the, that all of their reinforcers are fully provided so that they don't have to behave. Um, they don't have to, you know, learn something new or engage in anything effortful that they um, just, they're just cared for. And his argument is really that that is um, kind of a misuse of the word caring and compassion. And we actually might be doing more harm in those situations. Um And, you know, especially when you just consider the populations that most of us work with, autistic individuals um, or, you know, with other um, um, disabilities as well, that um, really our our, our goal should be helping these folks be the most independent, autonomous, uh, self-advocating folks that you can. And you can only do that through contingencies. Um, If if learning only happens through contingencies. Not a lot of learning goes on when um, strictly providing non-contingent reinforcement for folks. Um, That's not to say that it doesn't have its place. I think non-contingent reinforcement is sometimes absolutely necessary when you're first introduced to a student who is in crisis and who, you know, for example, is being restrained and isolated in their school setting. Um, You initially need to repair that relationship and repair their relationship to all the adults in their lives. And non-contingent reinforcement is exceptionally useful in those times to get out of crisis and rebuild relationships. However, if you stay there, um, it, it might not be of the best interest for for the child and, and for the, the folks who work with them. So thereafter, contingent reinforcement um, is how you're going to build skills. And it's really fantastic that there's evidence to support that people prefer those contingencies related to receiving them for free. Um, and, you know, kind of going back to the idea that like this preference for contingent reinforcement is not a trait. Um, it, it is really, um, you know, it, it, it's a response pattern that's a function of their learning history and their environment, which is incredible news because guess what? We're environment arrangers. Um, our, our, our bread and butter is creating successful learning environments. And so it's great that to know that we can arrange those environments that not, not only engender new skills, but that kids prefer. And so, I think um, a lot of us are, are in contexts under which we are arranging contingent relations, but I think there, there are also still a lot of settings out there in which the caring is coming in the form of non-contingent reinforcement. And um, I think we should be emboldened and empowered to create preferred contexts under which kids are behaving and feeling the success of behaving and receiving reinforcers. Um, yeah. 
Okay. Well, yeah, I guess uh, I guess the message to that BCBA on their way to work right now: if you get stuck, go back to Skinner. So I think that's uh, you know right it's probably not. <laughs> it's probably like a, just a general piece of advice, I suppose, that is uh, usually going to be helpful. So uh, it's really I, true. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, all right. Uh, is there anything else you want to comment on on this paper? I, I do want to. I do want to give people a sneak peek of your talk about feeding a little bit. Uh, we don't want to give them too much because we want them to sign up for the Stone mm-hmm, Soup Conference, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, because it is the best deal going. And it really, honestly, uh, it, it goes to an amazing cause. It provides uh, scholarships for individuals receiving ABA services. So uh, I know I kind of can kind of uh, in, in a silly way uh, I'll pump it up, but it, it really is an, a, a really an amazing cause uh, with a great It really is. Speakers. They're they're a fantastic organization and any support you throw their way is is going to a really, a really great place. Right. So having said all that, uh, yeah, sign up for the Stone Soup Conference. Uh, it's uh, it's a really great deal. Um, but anyway, we'll get to the feeding stuff. I just want to give you the opportunity if there's a final word or two that you have about uh, the, the the reinforcement paper. Uh, and if not, we can move on and talk a little bit about feeding. No, I, I think we we covered a lot a lot of the good stuff. Um, feel free to read read the paper, read that that original BF Skinner paper and. Because I, you know, uh, most of us are are applied folks working in those, you know, applied in natural settings, and so um, it, it it's so hard not to even read basic literature and, and connect it to the work that we're doing now. Um, but so I encourage you to, to read the paper and, and think about how it applies to your setting. Read that B.F. Skinner paper. Um, you know, it's an oldie but goodie. Those early early guys, they they had a lot almost more in common with, with today's ABA as, as it's, uh, being called than, um, a lot of the stuff that's happened, you know, in, in the middle. And so going back and reading their work, um, is pretty, um, fruitful. So yeah, read the paper, reach out if you want to chat about it. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's all for me. All right, cool. And I will link those articles in the show notes. So just go to behavioralobservations.com and click on the link for this episode or join the mailing list where you get the show notes for every episode sent right to your email. So uh, another shameless plug I'll put in there. So, all right, let's talk about feeding. Uh, So I, I, um, I don't, I don't want to ask you to do a, like a completely huge deep dive because there's been obviously decades and decades and decades of research on, on the how to address pediatric feeding disorders in uh, particularly in populations, uh, in autistic populations, et cetera. Um, and, and I also have another, uh, another uh, interview giving kind of like an over that I've already uh, recorded that has an overview of these things that I'll be putting out probably sometime later on in the fall. But, um, uh, but, but having said all that, I guess um, w- w- what, let's talk about feeding as a problem. Uh, and so what do we know about the prevalence of these types of issues, uh, particularly in the, uh, in the DD population or in the autistic population, uh, writ large? Certainly. So, um, we do know from various studies that, uh, there's a higher prevalence of feeding disorders with this population. Um, the, the percentage um, kind of varies wildly depending which which publication you're reading, but it's, you know, sometimes upwards of 90 percent, um, um, you know, 70 to 90 percent of the population has issues related to feeding. And I think partly that that percentage kind of varies so widely because the the issue of, of pediatric feeding disorders exists on a continuum, which is quite varied. So you have folks who just have food preferences, you know, there, there's maybe there's some someone out there who literally eats every single food with, with no issue but you know on one of the spectrum there's just having you know preferences and not eating certain foods um then getting into picky eating and a majority of children go through a picky eating phase or you know phases in which they're saying no to foods and then getting more into severe picky eating like food selectivity in which um kids are eating a narrower range of foods or or um, high frequency intake of just like one or two foods um and then getting more into afrid and total food refusal so the continuum is quite wide so it would not be unsurprising that at one for one any child falls along that continuum but that two um 
our, our kids and, and folks of the autistic population, and other DD populations um, fall on that spectrum. And I think there are, you know, um, so many reasons why that might be. Um, and, and it's, you know, idiosyncratic for every individual, why that might be, or they might have multiple, re- you know, an, an integration of various reasons to why they, they might be a more selective eater. Um, I mean, for example, like folks might have some like really severe sensory preferences, which, um, you know, mediate the types of foods that they're, they're willing to eat. Um, folks might have like an, in, an, um, a, an insistence on sameness. So the restricted or repetitive interest is a diagnostic feature of autism. Um, it, it's, uh, would not be surprising that those interests might feed over into, into feeding. Um, Sure. And I think a lot it, of us have seen kids or individuals in general who engage in severe problem behavior when they don't get, you know, the the craft mac and cheese cooked in the in in this particular mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. served on this particular dish in this particular way, and you know, yep, so, exactly, I mean, like a certain. Yeah, so I'm sorry I didn't cut you off, but yeah, exactly, oh, but yeah, there's the, and 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 the, and the caregivers are mortified to deviate from that routine because the, the it's, it's come uh, with a history of, 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 of crisis essentially mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. as a result of that. So it seems like some of these things are these really intricate is like contingencies layered upon contingencies. <laughs> oh, certainly. And, and food is so personal, you know, it is, it's directly tied to the health and well being of, of the child. And so that's, such as such a a battle that, you know, so many families are not willing to fight. Like they will get the brand. They will prepare it in the same way. They will heat it at the same temperature. They will drive to McDonald's to get the fries, but then drive to Wendy's to get the chicken nuggets. You know, it's, it's, um, you know, parents of really selective eaters are just like, um, I, I feel like their, their food preparations are just so on point. They could work like in any, in any high class kitchen, mm. uh, cause their skills for preparing the food in the same way every time is really admirable. Um, but yes, it, it's all to say that there are just so many reasons why kids might be food selective. And, and it's also been really interesting learning from autistic adults who talk about their own food selectivity, um, and report that it's really comforting to eat the same thing over and over because they know that it's going to taste the same every time. Um, and there's no surprises. There's, there's, there's often some like comfort and consistency. And so that is, um, you know, a, a relevant, uh, variable to this mm. as well. So a really complicated, nuanced issue. I see. I see. And, 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 uh... And, and again, there's, there's that this, this could be a like 15 podcast length of, of content here, but just in general, what, what, what is behavior analysis uh, historically offered as a, in terms of treat assessment and treatment of these issues? And uh, so yeah. can you walk us through just a, you know, kind of like a thumbnail sketch of that? Certainly. Yeah. So, so behavior analysis has actually been incredibly effective in treating severe life-threatening um, food refusal uh, cases and, and primarily relying on the notion that food refusal behaviors are um, negative reinforcement is driving the bus. Um, so, you know, escape and avoidance of eating that food. And so as a result, most of the treatment literature relies on escape extinction. And so in the form of, um, cause you, as you know, we can't fully prompt that response. Um, so we rely on procedures like really gentle, like physical prompting of the jaw or, um, non-removal of the spoon, um, you know, representing expelled bites of food back on the spoon. And so, um, procedures relying on the fact that these, that, you know, any sort of mealtime problem behavior is a function of escape. And so to the best of the ability, disallowing escape. And I say that that really is the majority, but there's a lot of other good work out there looking specifically at reinforcement contingencies and differential reinforcement and, and shaping, but, but it certainly is not the majority, um, and um, 
it's my opinion that there needs to be a lot more of, of those types of studies because um, out of every single client that I've ever worked with when I started back in Nashville, Tennessee, is um, falls more in the middle. Um, they, they've almost uh, ubiquitously have had issues related to eating, but um, have not fallen on that life threatening, needing to rely on a G tube type of situation. And here I am sitting in the kitchen of the mom of the parents home and need a feeding intervention that's going to work there and in that setting and with that that type of kid. And so um, the majority of um, the research in this uh, realm with behavior analysis is um, primarily escape extinction um, and w- with some players of some other uh, research out there relying like high P procedures or simultaneous presentation of, of preferred and non-preferred foods. So there is a little bit out there, but but it's a pretty... Um, homogeneous uh literature right now i see all right so what what approach are are um what approach are you taking to towards this issue right now and um and, and i guess you can maybe talk about that in the context of what you plan to discuss at the conference coming up here in october great so um yeah so i kind of um hinted at a little earlier when talking about the type of research that we started doing in our doctoral program, I was leading our our feeding clinical cases. And at the time that we were evaluating the enhanced choice model, we were also extending that over to um, our our feeding procedures too, because um, I think we, we had a client who wanted to leave the room or he wanted to leave the treatment or, you know, we it was like a new day and we were doing something a little more challenging. And he was like, I'm out of here. And uh, when we went to a a research meeting the next day with Greg and all of our colleagues, I think we're like, what do we do? He wants to leave. And Greg was like, well, let him leave. And, you know, you're like, clutch your pearls. You're like, what? Let him leave. We can't. (laughs) You lost your mind. (laughs) But treatment, he's never going to come back. And, you know, rightfully so. It's like, that would be a problem if kids wanted to leave our therapeutic context and never come back. And so that really began to shape the way that we did absolutely everything because spoiler alert, when you let kids leave and when you let them um, voluntarily opt in or opt out of the treatments, it actually enhances the efficacy of the treatment because your um, focus is on one, making that treatment as fun as it could be, but also a context under which they can be successful um, you know, gradually and systematically and which they can experience, you know, the success of contingent reinforcement. And so it really changed everything, uh, that we were doing at that time and, and continues to be incredibly inf- influential on my current clinical practice. And so the, the feeding interventions that we designed, it was really based on the fact that a majority of our literature was focused on really intensive, situations in which um, a restrictive procedure like escape extinction might be warranted. Um, On the other end of the spectrum, there are a ton of um, speech and language pathologists and occupational therapists who are um, evaluating this process called the sequential oral sensory method. Um, And it has a ton of social validity because everyone is doing it. Um, and it's really fun for the kids. It's fun for parents to watch, you know, they're playing with the food They're They're, you know, never pushing the kids where they're like escalating into any, um, uh, into any like problem behavior. And so it has really high social validity. Unfortunately, it's also just not, um, appropriate for a lot of the more severe food selectivity cases. It, it, it can, I, I'm sure it has a lot of um, relevance for a lot of kids, but, but also a majority of the, the kids that I've worked with, it, it's still kind of not quite enough. And so we wanted to create um, a balance, something in the middle between efficacy and social validity. So something that kids preferred that they voluntarily could opt into Um and that was also efficacious. And, um, and so that, that, that's what we were designing going into this process. And it was incredibly fruitful because we got some really great treatment results. Um, the paper is going to be published very soon in the International Journal of Developmental Disabilities. So you'll be able to see those data soon. Um, and we have since um, really attempted to push those boundary conditions of this phenomenon and have done it in residential settings, in schools, clinics, homes, 
um, conducted by parents or by classroom staff. Um, so have had a really great run of, you know, testing it out clinically across various settings as well. And so that is exactly what I'm going to share at the Stone Soup Conference. I'll get into the nitty gritty of all those procedural details, but um, that kind of is a really broad, broad overview of the type of feeding research that I and others are working on. Awesome. That that's the uh, the uh, the perfect, I, I guess, uh, uh, way to lead us up to that uh, that that talk. Because I'm tempted to ask you a gazillion other questions about it. I'll just have to. I'm wait. tempted to answer any question <laughs> on it. I'm like, all right, so, let's get into it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just have to type them into the chat uh, during the presentation. So uh, with exactly, a, with I'll be else. here for it. <laughs> uh, all right, all right. Very good, um, Holly. This has been a, a really fun conversation. It's flown right by for me. Um, I'd like to conclude by asking you what advice you might have for the newly minted BCBA or, you know, as I've kind of expanded this question over the years, you know, <laughs> some of this advice is great for BCBAs of any experience level, students, uh, RBTs, etc. cetera. So um, feel free to hop right up onto that soapbox. Sure. Yeah. I, I really love that you asked this question of everyone. Um, I, and I wish that I had had the behavioral observations podcast as a younger person in the oh, field. Thank you. I could have gotten so much great advice from people. Um, yeah. So, so I would, I would advise something that, that I wish that I had known sooner uh, when I was brand new to the field. And I really wish that um, I had been charged with the task of thinking about values earlier on. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, really taking some time to identify what you think your personal and professional values are with respect to how you interact with your clients with disabilities. Um, and, and I think you, I, I would advise you to look around your professional setting and see what you can identify as you know, in that, in your culture and context in your professional setting, what's considered cool? Like, like what, what is considered, like, what's the behavior that you do that gets you like a high five from your supervisor? What gets you a pat on the back? What gets you like a laugh at lunch? Um, you know, all, all related to your professional activities. Um, because I think it's important to, when, when, when you begin to identify your own values and then you, you know, put, put all of those interactions through that lens, you might find that some of those things are at odds with your, your personal values. And, and to be, you know, more specific here, I think in many early settings that I've been in, um, you know, people would brag about like the intense escape extinction session they went through with a kid or, you know, people are showing off their like bruises and their bites, like they're like a battle scar or, you know, as some like heroic venture that they did. And, you know, if you're bragging about the injuries that you sustained from a client, not only is that deeply uncool and um, highly disrespectful to the client, um, you're also bragging about being kind of a crappy clinician who's unsuccessfully treating problem behavior. So there's that too. <laughs> um, but but really in some, like I, I think it's important for people to really look at what your professional setting is valuing as important and, you know, special Um and, and ask yourself if that aligns with your own values. I, I think, I hope it, it appears that we are moving away from that notion and that kind of energy and culture within our field. And thank goodness, um, because I, I was right there. I, I totally took that on. I joined those, those settings and those cultures. And, and I was just like, oh, this is what's cool. This is what we value as practitioners. And it's really easy to just, you know, slide into those contexts and, and adopt those uh, values and, and interests, but, um, I hopefully we're moving away and it really does feel like we were, but, you know, it, it's sometimes surprising it, it, in the not so distant past, you know, have came across some early R, new RBTs or early direct staff who came from different centers and still kind of had that flair for how we talk about clients or the work that we do. And I think that is something that just like has got, got to go. 
Um, and so I think it takes a lot of self reflection. And so I think, um, that would be my advice to new, new practitioners in the field, or like you said, um, even those who have been in it for a while. That is uh, outstanding advice and uh, just a great way to close out the show. This has been a ton of fun, Holly. Thank you so much. Absolutely. I had a fantastic time. You're a great host. Um, this has been a, a really nice way to spend the morning. Thank you for listening to the Behavioral Observations Podcast with Matt Sicoria. You can find Matt's notes on this episode at www.behavioralobservations.com. We also invite you to stay connected with us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash behavioral observations and on Twitter at Behavior Podcast.